Cannon Wars, episode 12. What's gonna happen to our site? What's gonna happen to Palamon? What about Emily? Does anybody know what Emily thinks about anything? We're actually gonna find out in this episode and that's gonna be maybe a bit of a surprise. Uh, so this is gonna cover part three and part four of Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales, The Knight's Tale. Uh, here's a quick overview. Here, uh, the gods start to play a more direct role in what's gonna happen, a very direct role in what's gonna happen. Uh, so the beginning of the poem, First thing you need to know is like construct the lists. What are lists? That's basically like the tournament grounds where Arsite and Palamon and their armies of uh, 100 other knights are going to try to kill each other in their competition for the love, for the hand in marriage given from Theseus, not from Emily, but from Theseus, uh, of Emily. Venus, Mars, and Diana. First thing that's happened is their, uh, each of their temples are going to be described. And then we hear at the end of, part, uh, of uh, part three, really awesome, my favorite words in the, whole, in, the, in the whole poem are from Saturn. And they are really, really awesome. So let's get into it. Here we have, uh, we're going to talk about Venus, Mars, and Diana. Uh, the first temple that's described is Venus's temple. And these words that are uh, capitalized are like, what is, what's love all about? What's Venus all about? What, what, are the, what are the components of love? Well, you've got pleasure, hope, desire, foolhardiness, beauty, youth, baudry. Baudry is kind of like um, you know, riches, enchantments, force, lies, flattery, extravagance, Anxious labor, jealousy, joy, adornment is like decoration, you know, trying to make yourself uh, look very uh, fit, idleness, narcissists, all of those things are to be found in the temple of Venus. Moving down, what are we going to see with Mars? This is some pretty cool poetry here. Mars, we have, this is very, very dark. I'm just going to read it because it's kind of awesome. There, I first saw the dark plannings of treachery and all the execution of the plan, cruel ire, red as a growing coal, the pick purse and pale dread, the smiler with a knife beneath his cloak, the stable burning with its black smoke, the treason of the murder in the bed, open warfare with wounds covered in gore, strife, with bloody knife and sharp menace. The whole sorry place was full of strident noise. More I saw there the suicide. My heart's blood had soaked his hair. The nail driven by night into a man's temple and cold death on his back with his mouth gaping. In the midst of the temple sat misfortune with discouraged and sorry countenance. I further saw madness laughing in his rage Armed grievance, outcry, fierce outrage. Conquest. That's Mars's world. It's a dark world. And then finally, the temple of Diana. Chaste Diana. Diana, uh, among other things, was uh, the goddess of uh, virginity and of, um, of chastity. There's another word for it. Um, there it is right there. Hunting and modest chastity. Here's a bunch of stuff from Ovid, including Daphne, turned into a tree. And that's it for the description of the temples. Now he describes what the construction is like for the lists or the tournament grounds where uh, they're going to have a joust, jousting tournament and also hand-to-hand -hand combat. But I shall cease for a while on the subject of Theseus to, and speak of Palamon and Arcite. The day approached for their return when each of them should bring a hundred knights to decide the battle, as I told you. To keep their agreement, each of them brought a hundred knights to Athens, well armed in all respects for battle. So they're getting ready, and Theseus treats them very, very well. Everyone is treated very well. They're very courteous. They're very kind. They know that they're there to kill each other, but they are very, uh, they're very, they're, they're very friendly with one another, uh, even though they hate each other and want to kill each other. 
Um, and then here are, if you're a fan of Hamilton, you know that uh, even in, into the United States into the uh, 19th century, duels were uh, common. They're, they're maybe not common, but they, but they happened. When one man insulted the integrity or honor of another man, uh, sometimes the only answer was a duel with you know the rules that go along with the duel. Well, one of the rules is that you have to have a second, someone who is like your, your lieutenant, the person who's going to speak for you, negotiate for you. Um, and Palamon has one named Lycurgus, who's a king. And of course, our site has one who is uh, Emetrius, who is a king of India. That lets you know how far and wide these cultures um, spread. And this is preparations for battle. They're all ready to go for battle. And the night before the battle, we have Palamon and goes to visit the Temple of Venus. So each of the three temples that were described is going to be visited by one of the characters. And one of the characters is going to ask a favor, a prayer, make a prayer to the god. And Palamon is asking for this. This is what he says. This is his quotation. Venus, worthy of honor and reverence in her hour, he went, oh, sorry, this is not, this is the narration before he starts speaking, which is right here. Venus, worthy of honor and reverence, in her hour he went forth at a foot pace to where her temple was in the lists. And he is saying nice things to her about how great she is and everything he'll do for her if she's able to grant his wish, and this is his wish. But I would have full possession of Emily and die in your service. I implore you, find how and by what means to do this. He's saying he doesn't care if he dies. He doesn't care if he doesn't have a victory. The only thing that matters to him is that before he dies, he gets to be with, he gets to, he gets to love uh, Emily. And that is the most important thing, more important than his life. Um, and his prayer was actually answered because at last the statue of Venus shook and made a sign by which he gathered that his prayer that day was accepted. So this is important because now we're leaving the world where these gods and goddesses are metaphors, and in this particular poem, they are actual beings that can do things in the earth like make a symbol or make a sign. The next traveler to a temple is Emily, and she goes to the temple of Diana. And, uh, you know, it's very, it's, it is ironic. It is an irony. When we finally hear her speak, we are 1,460 lines into this poem. She has not uttered a word. And so did Emily and started out for the temple of Diana. And she makes it to the temple of Diana the first time she speaks in the poem. Here is what she says. Chaste goddess, well, you know that I desire to be a maiden all my life. I never want to be either a beloved or a wife. You know that I am still one of your company, a virgin, and love hunting and roaming in the wild wood and do not desire to be a wife and to be with child. I do not want to know the company of man, says the love object. The purpose of this whole poem, these two men willing to kill each other for this woman they've never spoken with, and she wants nothing to do with men. That is a huge irony. Moving forward, and but she does hedge a little bit. She says, And if it be that you will not grant me this favor, or if my destiny is so shaped that I must have one of the two, send me the one that most desires me. She's open to it. You know, it's not what she wants, but she's open to it. And how does Venus respond? Venus goes a step further. She actually speaks, or excuse me, Diana. Diana goes a step further. She actually speaks. She appears. She becomes flesh. She shows up and she says, Daughter, stop your sorrow among the high gods. It is declared and by eternal word written and confirmed that you shall be wedded to one of them who have had so much care and trouble for you. And so that is the position that Emily finds herself in. So now she knows she's going to have to get with one of these guys eventually. She'll just have to wait and see which one kills the other one. Uh, the Hour of Mars next follow this. And so Arcite is going to go to Mars to make his supplication, to make his prayer for Mars's favor. 
Um, so when he appears before Mars, here's what he has to say. Then, Lord, help me tomorrow in my battle for the sake of that fire that once burned you as much as that fire now burns me. Arrange it that I shall have victory tomorrow. So he doesn't ask for Emily's love. What he asks for from Mars by way to gain Emily's love is victory in battle. Well, that's something that Mars knows a lot about. So we'll see what happens here. At last, the statue of Mars, so now Mars, the statue, is going to make a symbol, began to make its coat of mail jingle with the sound he heard a murmuring, very low and indistinct, which said, victory. So it seems like each god is either going to grant the wish, grant the prayer, or at least be honest about not granting the prayer. And then here's the best part. This is the best, best part. This, these words right here, they make, they give me the heebie-jeebies because this is Saturn talking. This is Venus's father, or maybe grandfather, uh, the god Saturn, who in Greek mythology was known as Kronos or time. So this is time personified, the physical manifestation of time in the poem. And listen to what time says. I just have to read it because it is so good. My dear daughter, Venus, said Saturn. Venus was afraid. She was like, oh no, I know Mars is going to try to get his way and I want my way and what what's going to happen? Uh, Diana wants something different. My dear daughter, Venus, said Saturn. Remember, it was Palamon who talked to Venus. My dear daughter, Venus, said Saturn. My planetary course, which has to make so wide an orbit, has more astrological power than any man knows. Mine is the drowning in the pale sea. Mine is the prison in the dark hut. Mine is the strangling and hanging by the throat. Mine is the uproar and the revolt of the underlings, the discontent and the poisoning. I take vengeance and do not full and do full chastisement while I dwell in the zodiacal sign of the lion. Mine is the collapse of the lofty halls, the falling of the towers and of the walls. Upon the miner and the carpenter, I slew Samson, shaking the pillar. I read that line wrong, by the way. Mine is the collapse of the lofty halls, the falling of the towers and of the walls upon the miner and the carpenter. Pestilence. I am pestilence. Oh, so cool. Um, so he basically says, I got this. Don't worry about it. You're going to get what you want, Venus. I promise. So it's actually the day of the festival. It's like a big... Everybody's ready to go. They're all having a great time. There's feasting. There's celebration. It's the morning of the battle. And what's going to happen? Oh, Theseus is going to make a little announcement. He's like, you know what? This is such a great thing. Everybody's so happy. We're all here. It's just a great, joyous occasion. I'm going to change the rules. I don't want anybody to die. Nobody has to die. We're going to change it up so it's like you can fight, but don't stab someone. You don't have to kill someone. We're going to do this thing where it's like capture the leader. So you hundred knights protect uh, Palamon, 100 knights to protect our site. We'll see if either side can capture somebody. You can ride on your horse and, you know, joust each other, but, like, nobody dies is what he's going for. And if it happens that the chieftain is captured on either side, or else if he kills his opposite, so he, somebody might get killed, then the tourney shall last no longer. God speed you. Go out and hit hard. Kind of like, you can hear a football coach saying that, right? Go out and hit hard right before the game. Moving along, and here is the battle. So it wasn't like an easy battle. Up spring the spears 20 feet in the air. Out come the swords glittering like silver. They hew and cut to pieces the helmets. Out burst the blood in violent streams. The knights break bones with strong maces. That one thrusts through the thickest of the press. There strong steeds stumble and down go horse and man. So it's a, it's a heavy duty battle, but no one is killed. Palamon desires to kill his foe, but they can't really get to each other. Sometimes they do get to each other, and they're stabbing each other, and people are bleeding, and they're almost dying, but someone gets captured. Palamon gets captured. Palamon hit him so hard before being captured, 
But all this was for nothing. He was brought to the stake. His brave heart could not help him. He had to stay there when he was captured by force and also by the rules. Palamon was captured alive. And it's decided. This, the king goes, stop, no more. Our sight of thieves shall have Emily. All is resolved. Except for one thing. Remember uh, Saturn? Time? Time? A fury from the infernal region started up the ground sent by Apollo at the request of Saturn, which made his horse Arsite, who just won everything. His horse, by chance, by accident, stumbled Arsite. The horse pitched him on the pommel of the saddle and over his head so hard that he lay in the field as if dead, his breast crushed in with his saddle bow. Yeah, but maybe our site's going to live. So they're still having a huge party. Everybody's happy. The king is just ecstatic. He's like, I think he says this. or maybe, I don't know if the, this is the narrator. Remember the knight is the narrator, the actual knight who's walking down the road with uh, Chaucer is telling this whole story. For in fact, there was no defeat. Failing is a result of nothing but luck. So our site was unlucky. Palamon fought so hard that there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. But... Nature now had no dominion, and certainly where nature will not work, farewell medicine, go bear the man to church. In a word, our sight had to die, for which reason he sent for Emily and for Palamon, who was his dear cousin. Then he spoke thus, as you saw here, and he said very beautiful words about how much he loved them both. This is important stuff right here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so he's dying. He says beautiful things to his wife, who he's now gonna be leaving. He says beautiful things to his friend. He basically says, look, you guys, you should have each other. If you're gonna have anybody, have Palamon because he's, he's a good man. Um, but this is really important here. This is like, this is where, this is where Chaucer is doing the real work of like what literature is and what it's for. What is this world? What does man ask to have? One instant with his love, the next in his cold grave, alone and without company. Farewell, my sweet foe, my Emily, and softly take me in your two arms for the love of God and listen to what I say. With my cousin Palomar here. But this is the essential question. This right here is kind of what all of literature is all about. Is this, this is the human condition. This is the same thing that Shakespeare wrestles with constantly. What is this world? That is the question of literature, of art, of culture. What is this world? What does man ask to have? And then he goes a step further. His spirit changed its house and went where I have never gone. This is the knight narrating the story. I cannot say where. Therefore, I cease. I am no theologian. A theologian is a, you know, someone who studies theology and knows religion. I find nothing about souls in my book, and I do not wish to relate the opinions of theologians, even if they write where souls dwell. So, right, these are, there's a lot of different religious perspectives. There's a lot of different views on souls and what happens after death. And this is kind of what literature does. Literature's approach to the mystery of death is basically like, uh, we don't know, maybe, maybe. His spirit changed its house and went where I have never gone, what Shakespeare calls the undiscovered country, and what dreams may come in that undiscovered country. Beautiful. Oh, the sorrows and tears of old and young were endless in all the towns, the death of this Theban. There's irony there because the Thebans, the Thebans were the mortal enemies of the Athenians. Right? The play starts with them killing each other, and it ends with their great sorrow at the death of one particular Theban. Aegis, the mutability of this world, here's more of this deep, deep stuff. Just as no man, he said, ever died who did not in some condition live on earth, so, he said, there never lived a man in all this world who did not sometime die. This world is but a highway full of sorrow, and we are pilgrims passing to and fro. Now, there's a part of this that might be like pre-Christian. This might be a pre-Christian, and maybe uh, maybe Chaucer is trying to get at that a little bit, is that this is before the idea of uh, redemption, 
through, uh, through the religious doctrine of Christianity existed in the earth. So, so maybe that's something that he believed and he wanted to uh, put that out there knowing that his audience would be aware of that. We have another huge irony. This irony is so big. Okay, so throughout the poem, I've at different times indicated where uh, Chaucer, through the narrative uh, voice of the knight, is doing this, like using this irony where I'm saying, um, uh, this is too long to tell. I know that this is this is a long story. I'm going to skip that part. I'm going to skip that part. Well, now his irony is completely out of control. So if earlier you were saying, is that irony? Is he doing that to be funny? Is that part of the is that part of the meaning of this? Uh, yes. In fact, he might have very di di directly been making fun of Boccaccio because as long as this is, Boccaccio told the same story way longer. So. All of this is he's saying what he's not going to say. I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say any of this stuff. None of this stuff, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to examine it. I'm not going to describe it. All the way to here. I don't wish to tell, uh, but he just told us all of that. So that's the irony. That is, And that's a very funny irony. Uh, we may well discern then by this orderliness that the mover is immovable and eternal. I don't know if this is Theseus talking or his father Aegeus. No, it's Theseus. Um, so this is a very important idea. In so now we're, these ideas might be a little bit more uh, more Christian, um, and uh, interestingly so. We may well discern then by this orderliness that the mover is immovable and eternal. The mover is God. Anyone but a fool may easily see that every part derives from the whole to which it belongs, for nature did not take its beginning from a mere part or portion of a thing. So this is a very, very big concept that gets into uh, a Christian idea of providence, which is kind of like everything is exactly as the way that God intended it, even if though we don't quite agree or we don't quite see it. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean that it's not part of a plan that is much, much bigger than us. That is a theological idea that's put into the mouth of, uh, of a pagan, and uh, that's Theseus. And I want to get to the end of this thing. Oh, I'm almost at the end. Great. And then, after all this coming and going, what happens is that Theseus uh, requires Palamon and Emily into his presence. Some time has gone by. They have been in mourning. They have been wrecked. By, uh, by what they lost. Between them was then made the bond that is called matrimony or marriage in the presence of all the council and nobility and thus with full bliss and melody, Palamon married Emily.